Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast, Matthew chapter 24. And I consider this part, and I've probably said this before, but I consider this part of uh, the prophecies of Matthew 24 probably the most important prophecies given to us in the scripture because out of all the things that I've read concerning the newage movement, newage rhymes with sewage, out of the new age movement, secret societies like Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, other secret groups, the mysteries of the Catholic Church that I've talked about, um, all kinds of false prophecies, all of the claims made by uh, certain Latter-day Prophets, all of the claims made by those who are in the UFO movement, and on and on and on. All of those, every single one of them, point to this one event. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Matthew 24. And, and by the way, we now have the website up, ufopastor.com. I felt like the Lord gave me that idea. Um, there are not too many pastors that deal with this subject. Uh, maybe it's just not their calling. I'm not blaming them. Some of them wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole if God told them to. They wouldn't speak of it because of the... Um, the way people have treated this subject, but things have changed now. Especially since the New York Times came out, what was it, 2017, with their spread on how the government was spending black money studying UFOs. And now, since June 25th, we have the first ever real admittance from the United States government saying yes. Out of 140 some odd UFO cases that we have studied, we can only explain one of them. The rest of them, some 140 cases of military interactions with ships in the sky, we have no idea what they're from, where they're from, what they're made of, how they do what they do, so at what they want. What is their business here? What they're not saying is, these are extraterrestrial beings. They're not saying that, and I'm not saying they're not ever going to say it, but it wouldn't be for a while, I guarantee you. But since then, since the New York Times has come out with this, what that's done, it has opened it up for other major news outlets around the world to finally start talking about People citing UFOs without making fun of them, without saying, yeah, a couple of Bubba's were drunk and they said they saw hazy lights in the sky. Well, imagine that. See, they no longer do that now because this is big news. And the truth of it is there was a poll done a couple of years ago. In fact, a year or two ago, there are more people in the United States of America who believe in the possibility of alien life outside of this planet than who believe in God. What does that tell you? It tells you that there, is, ha, there has been a huge transformational paradigm shift in this, in this country and around the world. UFOs are no longer the anathema that they used to be. You couldn't talk about UFOs. Now you can. Because people are opening up. They're being honest. They're talking about my mother. My mother. Who saw me coming home with UFO books all the time from the school library. Never said a word to me until I was teaching on it one time and then my mom comes up to me and says, uh, you know me and 
an old friend that she had where we lived down in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, where I was, where I was born. She said they were on their way home, fixing to cross the levee where we lived. And there's a big lake next to it. And she said it was at night and they saw this amber colored saucer shaped disc hovering over that lake. And they drove by it and were staring at it like this. And it hovered and then it went like that. And I went, you never told me that? Like everybody else back in those days, they were afraid. You didn't tell anybody that. So anyway, let me read you Matthew 24, and, I'll, and this is what we're dealing with. Verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and here it is, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And we've looked at some of the verses that go along with this, like uh, Revelation chapter 6 and the opening of the sixth seal. The stars fall from heaven because they're shaken, like a fig tree shaken of a rustling mighty wind and it shakes the untimely figs loose from the tree and they all fall down into the earth. We know that Satan takes his tail, drags one third of the stars of the heavens to the earth. Then we find out later that those stars are the angels that are kicked out of heaven with Lucifer, with Satan, with the dragon. Okay, so... When we see stars here, we're not just talking about Beetlejuice. Yeah, there's a real star named Beetlejuice. Uh, we're not talking about uh, Andromedes. We're not talking about any of the other. We're talking about those being angels. And the scriptures make that very clear. I don't have those notes today, but they are coming up. We're going to just walk through the scriptures and show you Again, that stars are angels. So these stars that fall from heaven are the gods that are spoken of in the scriptures. Not the good gods, the bad gods. Not God, but little g, gods. Evil angels, devils, unclean spirits, familiar spirits. Um, the spirit that went into the mouth of the 400 prophets that lied to Baal. The spirit that came up out of the earth and appeared to be Samuel in front of Saul. Those are the gods that we're talking about. Now, let's go to a place in Deuteronomy where God not only warned about not worshiping these gods because, I mean, think about, think about it. These angels getting kicked out of heaven, they're going to come down to the earth. Naturally, they are superior to us in every way. They can do things we cannot do. They can, they have abilities and strengths and I mean, where does occult powers come from? Where does magic come from? Where does the power of telekinesis come from, which is moving objects with your mind? You're not moving it with your mind. You're just basically in contact with a devil who goes, moves an object for you. You can't see the devil. You just see the object move. All these videos on YouTube that are real, some of them are real, I believe, where people are going into haunted houses. All of a sudden, cabinets start opening up. All sorts of poltergeist things start happening everywhere. So let's face it, these gods that are getting kicked out of heaven to the earth are going to be superior to mankind in every way. And even those who are avowed atheists and say, I don't believe anything that I can't see, when they see these things, they're going to go, I believe. They're going to have to. Because it's going to be right there in their face and they're going to worship them as gods. So Deuteronomy 13, 
He said this in verse 6. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee. And notice what he says. From the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him. Now, God was serious to the Israelites about this issue of them worshiping other gods or idols. He said, I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to call you out and save you as a people and love you while you go out a whoring after other gods. And he said, I don't care who it is. I mean, you might not have a problem turning in somebody you don't know for a crime. But turning somebody in who is a family member turning somebody in to the police that you know has committed a crime, turning them in yourself. Let me tell you how, how hard that is. I've had to do it. One of the hardest things I've ever done, but I had to do it. I did it because I loved the Lord, I loved the law, and I loved the person that I had to turn in. It's not easy to do. But God says, I don't care if it's your wife, your brother, your son, your daughter, your best friend, your soul friend. If they tell you, let's go serve these other gods that our fathers didn't even know existed. Don't consent with them. Don't go along with them. Turn them in. Knowing that the punishment for that would be death by stoning. God said, do it. Okay? Now notice he said, number one, since your fathers didn't know about them. These are unknown gods. These are gods that nobody even knew existed. You see where I'm going with this? These are the extraterrestrial gods, not from here. We would call them alien because they are not from here. The Bible would call them alien and strangers because they are gods that are not from here. They are from a different place. And then he said, from the one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. Now, what does that mean? I've explained this once before, but let me do it again. There is actually, since, since, since number one, we don't live on a flat earth, and since number two, we've been able to send not just uh, machines, but we've been able to send people above a certain place where literally the earth and its atmosphere ends and outer space, what we call, and it would be called the second heaven in the Bible, that's where it begins. In other words, there is a line where clearly the earth ends and heavens begin. And it's called the Karman line. This is from... Uh, the article on Wikipedia, you can look at this up. This is certainly a physical boundary where aerodynamics stops and astronautics begins. Let me tell you just a brief little story. Um, um, Neil Armstrong was a test pilot and he was in this experimental jet plane that was... They were testing it out to see how high and how up far above the earth he could go. Um, this was presented in the first scene about Neil Armstrong's life called The First Man. And, in this, and this really happened. So Neil Armstrong's in this jet. Incidentally, 
the tail number of that jet, the end number, ended with the numbers 666. I'm not making that up. So anyway, he's in this 666 rocket. And he goes up to a place where all of a sudden his wings don't work. And his aerolines don't work. And his tail fin doesn't work. Because all of those require the movement of air to negotiate the motions of that particular plane. Now it's no longer an aeroplane. Now it's a spaceship. But he's gone above the atmosphere line. And so he turns a couple of rockets on and tries to go down, but he bounced back off the atmosphere because the atmosphere was pushing up against the bottom of the rocket and he couldn't get it back down in the atmosphere. What do you do now when you can't turn the, the aerolines and the tail and everything, you can't control it like an airplane, what in the world do you do? So he had little side rockets on there on each wing and he spun that thing sideways so that it literally sliced like a knife into the atmosphere. And that's what saved his life by being able to do that. Okay, smart guy. Smart enough to be able to do the, the very first landing on the moon. Okay, but study that out. You, it was, his tail number was N72666, if I remember right. Dun, dun, dun. So it's where aeronaut aerodynamic stops and astronautics begins. And so I thought, why should it not also be a jurisdictional boundary? This is the man, Theodore von Karman, who discovered it. A jurisdictional boundary. Haley has kindly called it the Karman jurisdictional line. Below this line, space belongs to each country. Above this level, there would be free space. Now let me tell you about why they would call it a jurisdictional line. The United States has absolute total rights ab about the airspace above the physical boundaries of the United States of America. And let's say a Chinese war jet ventures at I don't know, 70, 80,000 feet above the United States, but it's still in the air, that jet has violated United States airspace. And we have rights to that air above our country. And we would have a right then to either try to escort that plane out of our airspace or shoot it down. Because what's it doing? It's a military plane. What is it doing there? However, at the end of the earth, the Kármán line, that space above the United States does not belong to the United States. We don't own it. It's part of outer space and there really is no laws that govern the use of outer space I mean, let's say that you went 150,000 miles above the earth, which is about halfway to the moon. Can the United States shoot you down because you happen to be over the United States? No, space is free. So, so there literally is. When the Bible says the ends of the earth or the end of the earth, I think that's what it's talking about. It's where the earth ends and the second heaven or the heavens begin. Now I think this is important. Now, and oh, by the way, the Carmen line is 330,000 feet above the earth, 330,000. Think about that number for a minute, okay? Now Daniel 4.11. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto the heaven. There was a there is a line where the air stops and space begins. 
it reached unto heaven and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. So here's where a verse is where the Bible is putting the two ideas together. Where the end of the earth is, heaven begins. So the height thereof reached unto heaven, the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. Job 28, 24. For he looketh to the ends of the earth and seeth under the whole heaven. Where the earth ends, heaven begins. Job 37, 3. He directeth it under the whole heaven and is lightning unto the ends of the earth. There it is again. Under the whole heaven is where the ends of the earth are. Where this air of earth stops, that's where heaven begins. This is important. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night sheweth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Now, you could say, well, that just means the, you know, when the world ends, we won't need Bibles anymore. I think I would agree with that. But as with many scripture, there's always more than one interpretation that can apply. The words to, since, since the words, since the heavens are declaring this, their words go to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth, check it out, is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. In other words, the sun above the earth literally is above the earth. It's above the whole earth. And there's nothing, no particle of air or anything that's below the Carmen line that is not affected by the sun. In fact, the auroras that you see affected by the sun, heat from the sun, blend, bouncing off uh, ions in the upper atmosphere or however that works, everything below the Carmen line, which is the ends of the earth, is affected by the heat of the sun. And you got to remember, this stuff's being written 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago when nobody knew anything about where the atmosphere ended, where the sun really was. Nobody knew anything about this. And yet God, because he's the designer, he's the one who, write, who writes into his book of creation the blueprint for everything in the universe. He writes that, yes, there's a line where the earth stops and the heavens begin. And oh, by the way, I'm sending to you a nation from the end of the earth. A nation that didn't originate on earth so it's not going to be the russians it's not going to be the it's not going to be the bosnians it's not going to be the muslims it's not going to be the chinese i'm sending you an army from the ends of the earth think about it they didn't originate here on this planet they're coming the stars are in the heavens God's going to kick them out. Those stars are the gods and they're going to descend or fall down to this earth. And every man, woman, and child is going to worship them when they come. Except God's people. They won't do it. Back to Deuteronomy 13. This is about the false prophet. Remember what the false prophet does in Revelation 13? He causes uh, signs and wonders, lying signs and wonders, fire falling from heaven. He does miracles in the sight of the people. He makes predictions, and sure enough, they happen. 
He's the one who's going to be saying, let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known. Deuteronomy 13, verse 1, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Then thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And I'm telling you, tell your family members, tell the people you know, Warn people that a day is coming when the gods are going to descend to this earth. And I believe that people who sit in churches right now are going to be so deceived by these gods that they're going to worship them. Why? Because they've been suckling off of the vine of Sodom. Had a, a call from a pastor friend of mine this morning. And he was trying to, rem he had heard me speak this, and he was trying to remember that verse in Deuteronomy where it spoke of the vine of Sodom. And he says that um, his daughter works with a young lady who attends. Southern Baptist Church and a Methodist Church and has been asked this friend or this co-worker of this pastor's daughter is an open sodomite and has been asked to be a deaconess in this particular church. Who was it? The head of the Southern Baptist Convention a couple years ago, the president of the SBC, saying, we owe an apology to the LGBTQ+, plus, which means pedophile, crowd for the way we've treated them over the years. We owe them an apology. Not so. You see, he's been suckling from the vine of Sodom. What fruit has it produced in them? Because of the poison that's in these new Bibles and in the preachers that preach from them, because of that poison, they are going to go after that. First of all, they're going to be told of the sign and the wonder, and the sign of the wonder is going to come to pass. And these things are going to come down, and everybody's going to believe both the false prophet and that these gods are the Savior of mankind and God said I'm doing that to prove you because I believe shortly after that then God is going to translate his church but he's going to make it known before that day who really belongs to him and who doesn't he's going to give them a choice and after all the church members have chosen to go after the other gods I believe God's going to take the rest of us home. That's what I believe. Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 is the covenant God makes with Israel as a nation. And he says, if you keep all, all of my commandments, statutes, and judgments, I'll bless your land, I'll bless your field, I'll bless your children, I'll bless your cities, I'll bless your, 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 your fighting armies, I'll bless everything. If you don't keep all of my commandments... Well, then I'll curse your cities, I'll curse your fields, I'll curse your children. You shall borrow uh, from other nations. They will not borrow from thee. And then he said this, that verse 32, Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. What other people? And thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long. And there shall be no might in thine hand, no strength, no power. The fruit of thy land and all thy labor shall a nation which thou knowest not. What nation is that? 
Do we not now know all the types of people that are on this earth in all the countries? Do, do we not know that? Sure we do. I'm telling you, they're not from here. They're a different nation from a different place. A nation that thou knowest not, eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed alway. Then he said in verse 36, The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there sh shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. Deuteronomy 28, 42. All thy trees and the fruit of thy land shall the locust consume. That's uh, Revelation 9. But I can also tell you, there is a, and I haven't, finished this Watchman series dealing with the different types of aliens that people have reported. There, of course, are the, the draconians, the, the dragon, the serpent-looking aliens. Well, that's an easy one. They're the dragons mentioned in the Bible. There are the Nordics, the tall, white, blondes. Why do they call them the Nordics? Because they look like people from the north. Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, places like that, Iceland, places like that. But then there are the aliens that just freak people out when they see them. They call them the insectoids. Some of them look like praying mantises. Some of them look like locusts and grasshoppers. I wouldn't make this up, people. And because we know what our Bible says, that these are not just ordinary grasshoppers. These are devils that are in that form and shape. Then this takes on a whole new meaning. All thy trees and the fruit of thy land shall the locust consume. But he's not done. So now he says in verse 48, same chapter. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in one of all things. Let's count this. Therefore thou shalt serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. Four things. That's your fourth kingdom. Then he said... And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck. Now we have another connection to Daniel 2. Because the fourth kingdom is the iron kingdom. And the yoke is what binds them together. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Then it says, until they have destroyed thee, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far. Where from? From the end of the earth. From beyond the Carmen line, 330,000 feet up in the air. From beyond that line is where they're coming from. As swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not under stand that spirit's already in some churches isn't it a nation of fierce countenance when people saw Whitley Strieber's uh, he had an artist rendering of an alien that he had seen regularly that he was being abducted by they freaked out because all of a sudden now, people started remembering that they had seen this monster before. And they truly are a people of fierce countenance. Because as people who were being abducted by these things saw them, it scared them to death. And many people who 
could have been regressed in with hypnosis or even were being regressed in hypnosis, as soon as the sight of these creatures came in, they stopped right then. They said, I'm, I'm not talking about it anymore. Wake me up. And they wouldn't do it. A nation of fierce countenance, whose tongue thou shalt not understand. A nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle. Linda Moulton Howe, has been, is she's the expert, been studying these cattle mutilations since the 70s. And all of them, and it's not just cattle either, it's horses, it's uh, deer, it is uh, moose, it's uh, uh, caribou from the forest, things like that, mountain goats. Laser-like incisions around the side of the mouth, taking out the tongue with no blood, not, not a molecule of blood in the body anywhere. They can't figure out how they got all the blood out of the bodies of these cows and goats and everything else. Almost always on the females, taking the udders off. On all of them, male and female, removing the genitalia off of them with laser-like precision. In some cases, the cows just go missing forever. But in most cases, they will excise the things that they want and then just drop the cow on the ground, usually facing north. He shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil. Do you know corn, wine, and we're getting, this is where we're going. After this part, we're going to study the connection between these falling stars and secret societies. Because I promise you, Everything that every secret society has as its secret, its, its um, great work, is the joining of heaven and earth together. Remember what Nixon said in the phone call that he made to um, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong? While they were standing on the moon, they had set the American flag in place. Nixon calls from the White House, and he says, Because of what you two have done, the heavens have now become a part of man's world. Never been done before. But that literally started the dawning of the age of Aquarius in the new age. The age at which the ascended masters will come down and enlighten us all and bring us, evolve us into higher conscious beings so that we take care of Gaia, Mother Earth, and there will be no more wars on the earth and everybody will be happy and there will be plenty of food for everybody. And, and we won't use money anymore. And everything that you see on Star Trek will, be, will have that. Because the gods will come down and save mankind from themselves. But anyway, I brought up masonry because in a, in a Masonic cornerstone ceremony, it's weird because they use three things in their ceremonies when they lay a Masonic cornerstone of a brand new building that's being built. They pour on the cornerstone corn, wine, and oil. What does your Bible say here? Also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil. And of course there's a great big square and compass on there or the increase of thy kind or flocks of thy sheep. 
until he have destroyed thee. My friends, that day, that day, I'm telling you, it is the singular most important uh, prophetic day, uh, one of them, but also the singular most important day of every fake religion in the world for thousands of years. Religions, witch doctors, medicine men, gurus have all been waiting for the day when the doorway to heaven would be open to mankind, when man would finally ascend up and become part of the heavens. That day is coming. Last week, For the first time, a group of civilians took a ride on a civilian-built rocket where they went up above the Kármán line, thus becoming astronauts and their ship becoming a spaceship, and then landing again on the Earth And even, even some lost people, when they took a look at the rocket that Jeff Bezos built and sent up there, I'll let you look at it. I, I won't say it. I'll let you look at it. You decide what you think it looks like. Okay? That's all I'm going to say. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 26. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep. See, this sounds like Joel's army, doesn't it? Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken, whose arrows are sharp. And all their bows bent, their horses' hooves shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. That's, that's an energy vortex, is what it is. Their wheels. Remember what was so special about the chariot of God in Ezekiel chapter 1? It was the wheels that transported the chariot based upon where ever the spirit of the four living creatures, the four angels, wherever they wanted to go, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels, that's where the wheels took them. Verse 29, their roaring shall be like a lion. Think of the beast. And they shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry it away safe and none shall deliver it. And in that day shall, they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look into the land, behold, darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. See what he's talking about? God is going to hiss at this nation who's going to come from the end of the earth, and their wheels are going to be like whirlwinds. Energy vor gravity vortexes is what they are. And when they come, the light of the heavens are going to be darkened. That is exactly the day that Jesus prophesied of in Matthew 24. Isaiah 13, 3. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. Where do they come from? They come from a far country, from the end of heaven. 
even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. People, they are not coming from Romania, Canada. They're not coming from Denmark. They're not coming, they're not coming from any place on this earth. God specifically said they're coming from the end of the heavens. They're coming here. He is sending these gods. They're, they're losing their estate. Their estate is in heaven. Where they live is in heaven. God is kicking them out. They will fall to this earth become the gods of this earth, and I promise you every scientist is going to believe in them. Every atheist, Bill Nye the science guy, is going to bow before them. And then he's going to be like, I want to know how their ships work. I want to know how their energy beams work. I want to know why they eat cows. Ugh. Anyway, I promise you that day, everybody on the earth is going to change their religion except those sealed with that Holy Ghost of promise. So, let me give you just a little preview now of where we're going next week with this. Because now that we've established that these stars are gods, devils, angels, you can call them fallen angels because that's what they're going to be. Uh, even the word Nephilim, and I don't use this a whole lot, but it literally means to fall. And it's in reference to the giants. It is because their fathers, the sons of God, angels, left their first estate, fell to the earth. Go watch City of Angels with Meg Ryan. Go watch, um, I I mentioned this last week, go watch uh, The Space Between Us. Because it's about the exact same thing. an angel falling from his estate to the earth because he wants to marry this good looking Meg Ryan or this teenage boy uh, who was born on Mars who makes the trip all the way to earth and then mates with his teenage girlfriend He goes back to the stars, and you see her training. She's going to end up there with him one of these days. See what what it's telling you? These movies are foreshadowing. They're laying it in our minds. This is what's going to happen. So let me show you where I'm going next week with this. Um, So we have in Matthew chapter 24 where it says the stars shall fall from heaven. And after that, in verse 31, he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Okay, Mark says then from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Okay, so wherever they are, he's going to gather them all together. That, my friends, is the joining together of Christ, the bridegroom, and his church, the bride. Matthew 25, Jesus follows all of this up with this parable. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. 
But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready with, went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. So it's clear to me that when Christ appears in the air and we, his bride, join with him, we're going to the marriage. Amen. But the door is going to be shut. By who? By the, by the bride? No, because only Jesus has the ability to shut a door and no man can open or open a door and no man can shut. And right now the door is wide open, just like the door to the ark. Anybody who wants to go can go. And I hope that's you going. I hope it's me going. Ephesians 5, verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. That's Christ leaving God and Heavenly Jerusalem, which is the mother of us all, coming down to appear in the clouds, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And remember, the mystery has to do with a lot of things. It has to do with the opening of the eyes of Israel. It has to do with, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. So the mystery of Christ the bridegroom, the church the bride, is linked with the mystery of, at the end, the consummation of the time of the Gentiles, Israel's going to have their eyes open. We are going to be with Christ in heaven at the marriage, joined with him forever. We literally will be his body. Somebody say amen. Now, for everything that God has, the devil's got a really fouled up version of it. He's never had an original thought in his life because all he can do is say, I will be like the Most High. And so he doesn't come up with a completely new religion. He simply takes God's religion, flips it upside down, turns it 180 degree, degrees and says, here's the real truth right here. Like, you know, when we die, we're going to be given a resurrected body and we shall be, we shall then know Christ for we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Our new bodies are going to be fashioned in the image of Christ. We are going to be his body. Okay? So, God the Holy Spirit Mary a virgin, the Holy Spirit conceived in her without mating with her, very important, without mating with her, conceived in her, Jesus Christ. And she gave birth to the Son of God, the one Son of God. One Spirit, one virgin, one Savior. You see it? Now let me show you the exact opposite of that. Genesis 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God, plural, saw the daughters of men, plural, that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. Marriage. They had marriages with these women. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Let his days, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. 
there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So let's examine this. We have the Holy Spirit of God, the Virgin Mary, and the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Holy One of God. The Most High Son of God. The devil takes this idea, rests it, you know, twists it around, sends sons of God, multiple angels, falling down to the earth, making marriage with multiple daughters of men, producing the Hebrew word as nephalim. Nephal means the fallen ones, and the im means there's a bunch of them, it's plural, translated as the giants because that's what they were. And so you see the opposite here. A marriage of God and the Virgin Mary producing the Son of God, Jesus Christ. The marriage of evil angels lusting after human women, making marriages with them, producing in them the evil giants. And God hated the giants. He, they were an abomination to him because of how they were. The angels broke the rules of God. God did not consent to their marriage. God did not give them over to be married. He simply let them fall to the earth to make those marriages with women. Now, in a particular church, the Mormon church, they have what's called sacred marriages. And because they believe that if a good Mormon man and a good Mormon woman makes a marriage, has a temple marriage, and remains married all of their life, that when they die, they both become equal to God. And they are then given their own planet to rule over and produce children on that planet like our God produced children on this planet. My question has always been, if they're equal to God, who gives them the planet that they're going to have? There must be a higher God than Jehovah. Never made sense to me. But as part of the temple endowment ceremony, they're given holy underwear. A little bit different than the holy underwear that I had was it when I was a kid. But notice what's on it. Wikipedia even wrote an article about this and told the truth about it and said, the marks in the garments are sacred symbols. Thus, the V-shaped symbol on the left breast was referred to as the compasses, while the reverse L-shaped symbol on the right breast was referred to by early church leaders as the square. You see, I don't know if you knew this or not, but when Mormonism started, they moved to Nauvoo, Illinois to escape the persecution by the good Christians up there who weren't going to put up with their nonsense. And then Nauvoo, Illinois... Joe Smith, Brigham Young, and all the leaders of the Mormon church, the leader men of the Mormon church, they all became Freemasons in Nauvoo, Illinois. And they learned the secret rituals, handshakes. They learned the secret symbols of Freemasonry. They understood the meaning of the square and the compass. They understood its sacred 
significance and they didn't have a problem in the world with it. And so they put on the holy underwear the symbol of the square and the compass. What does that mean? That's what we'll look at next time we get together. God bless you. I love you. I hope you're gaining understanding of this. Because this event, we can see it slowly happening. The disclosure and the, the opening up of man's consciousness to the fact that there are things up there that are interacting with our world. And this is not just cuckoo land and science fiction. Man's consciousness is being changed so that man now is accepting of this rather than, I did, you see a UFO and it does all kinds of things in front of you and you are freaking out. And then everybody says, did you see that last night? I didn't see nothing. You didn't see that? No, I didn't see anything. People years ago were scared to death to even bring it up because they'd be called nuts and kooks. But nowadays, the UFO channels on YouTube are among the, some of the highest rated channels on YouTube. People make their living showing UFO videos and talking about it. So I'm telling you people, that's what's coming. And whether you want to believe in them, them and UFOs or not, I, I'm here to tell you, again, they're not Martians living on another planet. These are gods that God is going to kick out of heaven. And they're coming here. So I would start broadening my understanding of the Bible and Bible prophecy and what's going on in this world rather than having such a closed and narrow mind about it because they're going to come. I believe it according to the Word of God. This is Pastor Mike. You're the reason why we do what we do. We appreciate you and your love and your support for us. Keep praying for us. Keep praying for our ministries, the people of Kenya. All of us here at Bethel Church, we love you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.